Welcome to this new episode of Ask Stago, the podcast dedicated to provide expert answers to your expert questions in hemostasis. I'm Audrey Carlo, and I'm glad to co-host again this show today with Cécile Urquet. If you are one of our followers, you must know that we have already discussed during season two about the different tools and parameters to check when validating an instrument, be it at manufacturer's site or in a lab. But technically speaking, what should be performed? What type of tests to run? This is what our guests will explain us today. And for this new episode, we are glad to welcome Kathleen Peck from USA. Kathleen, you are technical support specialist in our US team and are used to support our customer during their validation process. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Audrey and Cecile. It's an honor to speak with you today. Thank you, Kathleen. Well, if you know, we are trying to make it simple in Ask Stago and to always start with the basic. So what are the main guidelines available in the American market around instrument validation? There are many available guidelines for laboratorians to follow in the U.S. I think for coagulation analyzers, a great place to start would be Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute, or CLSI Guideline H57, Protocol for the Evaluation, Validation, and Implementation of Coagulometers, and the College of American Pathologists All Common Checklist. ISO 15189 standard is also listing the piece of evidence to achieve, but it's quite generic. In France, we have the SHGTA documents that help uh, detailing the type of performances to document for validation and accreditation, but many countries will refer to the CLSR outside the USA as well. Yes, CLSIs are becoming a state of the art. And there are obviously different guidelines. Nevertheless, there are some common recommendations. And Caitlin, can you tell us what are the recommended accreditation protocols to perform to implement a new system in a laboratory? Sure, Audrey. According to the College of American Pathologists, for unmodified FDA clear tests, it is important for the laboratory to verify the accuracy precision, reportable range, and reference intervals for the new test system. So this, when you apply the test as cleared by the manufacturer. Exactly. And modified or laboratory determined test also require studies to validate analytical sensitivity, analytical specificity, or, or interferences in addition to the other four parameters. Since in the U.S., FDA clear tests are more common in the labs, I can elaborate more on the aspects of their verification. That sounds like a plan indeed. Can we start with accuracy, maybe? Yes. CLSI defines accuracy as the agreement between the result of a measurement and a true value. However, since methods and reagents vary widely in coagulation testing, especially for global screening tests, true values are not applicable. So to verify accuracy in coagulation testing, we want to run a comparability study. This involves using the laboratory's current instrument and reagent system as a reference method to compare the new instruments and reagents. Can you remind us uh, how many samples should be used for this uh, comparability study? The number of samples for this study can vary depending on test complexity, but CLSI guideline EP09 denotes 40 samples. Commercial plasmas, as well as patient plasmas, can be tested between systems to prove comparability. Samples should include both normal and abnormal values, with attention given to clinical decision limits and cutoff values. What's nice about this study is that when your correlation samples span the reportable range of the assay, it also verifies the reportable range. As you can recall, this is one of the items you need to verify for your new test system. Kathleen, now we have covered accuracy. Can we talk about precision? I think this was the second item of your list of performances to be checked for FDA clear tests. Of course. Precision is defined by CLSI as the closeness of agreement between independent test results obtained under stipulated conditions. Precision studies can include repeatability, also known as interim precisions, and reproducibility or interlab precisions, formerly known as total precision. For repeatability, one sample is run multiple times or in replicate within one run of testing. This keeps outside variables such as change of reagent vial, operator, etc. to a minimum. Within lab precisions are when single measurements are made over the course of a few days, usually totaling between 20 and 30 points. And I think that there we can also uh, have in mind the CLSI guideline EP15, which describes a slightly different method running replicate testing over several days to prove precision. Right. 
One common point, though, any method should include at least two samples at differing levels, such as a normal and abnormal sample or control. Acceptance for these studies can vary between assays, so be sure to consult your manufacturer or medical director for appropriate acceptability criteria. Actually, I know also that some learning societies such as the GFHT in France has proposed some acceptance limits for precision. And moving to the underperformance list, Caitlin, reference ranges. We had a full podcast on it uh, with uh, one of your colleagues from Stago US team, Tara Simpson, last year. Caitlin, can you remind us the essentials of it? Sure. Reference ranges should either be established or verified when starting a new coagulation system. CLSI guideline EP28 does a great job of outlining this process. This guideline denotes 120 normal donor plasma to establish a new reference range. This would be most applicable for laboratories starting with a completely new coagulation platform. For labs with an existing reference range on a system that uses similar methodologies and reagents, it may be enough to verify your existing range using 20 normal donor plasmas. And a transference validation can also help a smaller laboratory adopt a reference range established by another laboratory or by a manufacturer. Exactly. This involves the statistical comparison of a range generated from at least 20 normal plasmas with the original, more robust range. With any method, make sure to use well-screened normal donor plasma. This involves taking steps to make sure your donors are healthy individuals that represent the population to be evaluated by this range. And collection and storage of the donor plasma should mimic conditions usually seen in the lab. Meaning, if your lab usually runs fresh samples, use fresh donor plasma. And if you're in a reference lab that routinely runs frozen aliquots, treat your samples similarly. Also, when establishing your reference range for the PT test, be sure to use at least 20 normal samples to calculate your mean normal prothrombin time, which is used in the INR calculation. In addition to the reference ranges, laboratories using APTT to monitor unfractionated heparin should also establish their heparin therapeutic range when verifying a new coagulation system. This can be accomplished using the Brill-Edwards method of evaluating ex vivo plasma from heparinized patients. CLSI guideline H47 can give you more information about that. So now we better understand the performances to check. What are your main recommendations, Caitlin, the ones you usually provide to customers so that they can run those experiments as smoothly as possible? Well, I like to think of the verification or validation process as a scientific experiment. Make sure to have a clear, concise plan for your experiment that is acceptable to your lab director and medical director before you get started. Make sure to keep acceptability criteria for each test in mind when performing these tests. It's easier to troubleshoot potential problems in real time rather than after the experiments are complete. As with all science experiments, it's very important to keep variables to a minimum. Uh, Caitlin, what do you mean with variables here? Um, let me give you some examples. If your laboratory has a low volume of samples, you may need to aliquot and freeze specimens to use for comparability studies. This is acceptable, but make sure to retest the thawed plasma on the reference method, as well as the new method to control specimen integrity and the variables that can come with it. Also, if comparing like instrument and reagent systems, use reagent of the same lot that were prepared at the same time to control possible reagent sensitivity issues. An example, when comparing prothrombin time, it would be best to use the same lot of thromboplastins to ensure you have the same ISI on both the current and new systems. As usual, the respect of the recommendations of use of the system and reagent are a key point. I would suggest our audience to check out the podcast, How to Calibrate Like a Pro, for a nice reminder about all the technical points to check uh, to work in the best way. But coming back to our subject, as you spoke about sample aliquoting and freezing, stumble, uh, like sample stability is also an important point of attention. You're right, Cecile. Sample stability should be strictly adhered to, as some coagulation factors are labile. Long lapses between runs can affect correlation results. It's best to move samples immediately from the current to the new system, or vice versa, when performing comparability studies. By keeping all these things in mind, you can be sure to have a smooth transition between your current and new platforms. Well, thank you, Caitlin. I have the feeling we have all your tips now and that we all have a better vision of the subject now. It was really interesting. So the podcast is almost over now, but thank you again. And thank you all for listening. As usual, 
All literature sources and links to previous podcasts are listed in the podcast description box. And please feel free to send us any question that you may have at our email address, askastago.com. We'll be glad to answer it in the next episode. See you next time. This podcast is brought to you by Stago. Diagnostics is in our blood.